Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM and the ID51. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by ting.com. Ting is a new mobile phone service that makes sense. You'll save money with Ting. You pay for what you use, not a penny more. It doesn't require a contract, and you get unlimited devices on a single pooled plan. To save $25 on your first Ting device, visit hamnation.ting.com. This is Ham Nation, episode number 82, January 23rd, 2013. The Soft Rock Payoff. Well, if it's Wednesday night, it must be Ham Nation night. Hello, everybody. I'm Don, AE5DW, uh, here in uh, uh, South Mississippi. It's not so sunny now, but it was a gorgeous, gorgeous day today. We got up to right about 70 degrees and have had some sunshine for the last few days, which is a market improvement from the week or so that we've had of rain. So we're finally uh, finally starting to, uh, uh, to dry out a little bit. And... Uh, it was considerably colder a couple of hours to the north where my friend uh, George Thomas, W5JDX, lives up in Jackson. How are things uh, up in Jackson tonight, George? Well, things are going good tonight, uh, Don. We're looking forward to a big weekend here. It warmed up today. It got up, uh, oh, I guess around 70 or so, although it has been a little cooler than that this week. You and I have got the uh, run of the show to ourselves tonight. I think we'll have Cheryl in a little lady, uh, later, but uh, Bob is in Anaheim at the NAM show, and Gordo's in Quartz Fest. Yeah, so uh, while the warden's away, the uh, the convicts are in charge. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you've got the B team tonight, but that's all right. We'll, uh, we'll certainly uh, muddle our way through. And uh, so how, how cold did it get? You, got, you actually got some snow up there in Jackson, didn't you, for a little bit, uh, George? Uh, yeah, we got a little bit last week. Uh, I think they we had three inches here, and it came in about midnight, and by about noon the next day it had all melted, and I think it got up in the 50s. Yeah, I saw some of the pictures that uh, the MFJ guys put. Uh, of course, they're a little bit farther north of you, the, yeah. some, some of the snow shots that they put on their Facebook page. And uh, we got uh, no snow. I think we may have gotten a flurry or two uh, that one time uh, with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of rain, but... Uh, uh, no, no snow down here in South Mississippi, uh, and and it's, it's it's a rare 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 when it does snow down here. Every once in a while in New Orleans, we, I remember we got snow in New Orleans on uh, Christmas Day uh, two or three years ago. That was uh, that was pretty interesting. Well, again, Georgia uh, Cheryl will be in with the uh, with the chat room. We'll say hello to her in a, in a few minutes when she gets here. But big plans this weekend. Speaking of uh, of up around Jackson, there is a big ham fest, and it's right in George's backyard. George, tell them a little bit about the uh, Jackson Ham Fest coming up this Saturday. Yeah, it's the uh, 2013 Capital City Ham Fest here in Jackson, Mississippi at the Trademark by the uh, State Fairgrounds Coliseum. And it's it's always a big ham fest, one of the better ones in the South. There is a huge flea market here, nothing on the scale of Dayton now, of course, but still uh, a pretty good size one, a number of new dealers as well. Uh, they've got a website up if you'd like to go learn more about it. That's uh, hamfest.msham.org. They still have a few tables left if you want to bring some stuff up and rent out a flea market table or you just want to rent out a place to sit. But, uh, you know, it's growing every year, Don. It gets a little bit larger. So we're looking forward to a big turnout there this year. And uh, thanks to the Jackson Amateur Radio Club for putting this on every year. It's a good little ham fest. I do enjoy it. I've been going to that one for a long time, and uh, I do enjoy it. Well, Cheryl is here. Cheryl, how are you tonight? Oh, and her mic is muted. Ah, your mic is muted. We know hear you. Hey. There you are. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hi, Don. My mic is unmuted now. Sorry about that. And hi, George, and everybody that's that's in the chat room and watching and uh, listening uh, later on. I just wanted to say welcome to Ham Nation, and it's always a pleasure to be here. And what's what's going on behind the scenes, guys? Fill me in. I see you got the uh, the blue shirt memo tonight. That's good. That's good. We were wondering about that. 
it's uh no it's we're we're just uh, we're just muddling through like we said earlier the, the convicts are in charge of the asylum tonight and uh since the since uh, you know the parents are away and uh and we're just we're having a uh, we're having a good time we're going to get into some show us your shack things here in a little bit we're going to talk about fox hunting uh, we've got uh, the amateur radio newsline report coming up we're going to do a little bit more with smoke and solder and the contest and uh, we're going to talk to some folks in the chat room uh, courtesy of you and it's just going to be a good night here on ham nation as it always is you betcha sounds good don i'm, I'm looking forward to it good it's good to see you in. I want to get the questions in from all you guys, so don't make me ask you later on. I want to get some good, good quality questions. Let me just quickly sign in, and uh, we'll we'll take them and and go ahead and roll it. Back to you. Very, very good. Well, let's so let's go ahead and get into some of the show us your shack stuff. We always like to see. Uh, pictures of toys here on Ham Nation, and especially toys that other people own, because we uh, we can be envious. George, if you want to go through the show us your shack stuff, Alex, if you want to pop those up, we'll uh, we'll take a look and see see what kind of toys we have out there tonight. Okay, these photos came from David Shackley, N9FGP, and the first one here, he says he's been watching Ham Nation since he got relicensed last year. And he was first licensed as WN8AOI when he was at Howland Junior High School in Warren, Ohio, back in 1968. So I guess this is probably a 1968 photo. Don, I don't even see a microphone there. I guess he was working CW exclusively. Big time CW op, uh, apparently. And uh, nice to see a young kid in the ham, in the ham radio. That's excellent. Yeah. And uh, the next photo here. He says his license expired, and he later returned as K8JRC uh, while he was in the Air Force flying uh, B-52s as an electronic warfare officer in Michigan. And uh, he had a couple of uh, Air Mobile QSOs from the B-52. Uh, about 18 months ago, uh, a friend said David should get back into ham radio. So in July of this year, or actually 2011, he tested and passed and got his uh, tech in general. And then in November of uh, 2011, he passed his amateur extra, thanks to Gordo. And the next photo here is of David's great uncle, who was a ham in the 1930s. And David was able to find the photo of his uncle, Les, W1ASK. And the back of the photo says it was taken in March of 1934, but there's a uh, March 1933 issue of QST on the table, and David still has that. Uh, Don, when I first saw this one, I thought maybe Don Knotts had his license. It does resemble Don Knotts, doesn't it? That's that's yeah. I hadn't thought of it. I was I was keying on the QST uh, down there. That does look like, doesn't that look like Don Knotts? It sure does. Wow, look at yeah, that old like microphone with the spring suspension on it. That's killer stuff. Look at that. Yeah, and those old uh, carbon headphones there too. Well, I'd like to have an old <laughs> mic like that. I would, too. Yeah, and the fourth photo here says you can see the uh, same 1933 edition of QST and this photo in David Shack, along with the e-version of QST on his iPad. And he hopes that uh, 80 years from now, someone will recognize both the iPad and the printed issue. Well, thanks for those photos from your shack, David. It's uh, it's always interesting to see what some of the viewers and listeners out there have. And, uh, boy, we really like that picture of your uncle there. That's uh, That was a real classic. Uh, Don, I understand we've got some news from ICOM here tonight. We do, as a matter of fact. Uh, we're, we're, you know, new toys. We always like seeing new toys and old toys, too, uh, talking about the, the, the Show Us Your Shack pictures. But... But new toys especially, and I can't wait to uh, see all the new toys at the Jackson Ham Fest this weekend. Well, the wait is very close to being over now. There have been some ID-51 sightings over the last few weeks. And, uh, you know, the new toys, the ID-51 is an exciting new radio from ICOM. This is a handheld, true 5-watt, dual-band D-Star radio. It has the same user interface that uh, was introduced with the ID31A, which made it a lot easier to get into D-Star. There's a bit of a learning curve on D-Star, especially with programming all the parameters for the repeaters and everything. Well, the ID31 stream that, streamlined that like you would not believe. Well, the, the 51 has that same uh, user interface. It's very, very simple. What's neat about this is it has an internal GPS. Uh, other radios, they have a little GPS module that you have to stick on top of the radio. Not with this one. It's built into it, uh, totally seamless, and a built-in D-Star repeater directory with what's called a near 
me repeater lookup. Here's how that works out. You uh, you you read your uh, your location via the GPS, and it looks into the repeater directory, and it pulls up the repeaters that are near you and slides them right into the memory. Easy as it can be. There's a lithium-ion battery pack. Gone are the days where you would plug your radio in and say 12 hours later it would it would be charged. Not now. You uh, you can charge that thing up in three hours. Your radio is fully charged in three hours. There is a broadcast radio receiver with an active band mute. That means you can listen to the ball game, the Super Bowl coming up in a couple of weeks, or you know the basketball game or anything else, your favorite talk show, your favorite music station, while monitoring the other two receivers. The game or whatever you're listening to on the broadcast band will mute, and uh, and the traffic on the ham radio bands will come in. This is great if you're doing... Uh, public service work, you're working a marathon or whatever, and you're waiting for some tactical uh, communication to come through. But while you're waiting on that, uh, you can listen to your favorite entertainment stuff. There's free programming software included with this. The CD comes with the radio, so you don't have to go online and try to find anything. It's all right there. It's ready to roll right out of the box. And ICOM, ICOM just makes, makes killer radios. I've been an ICOM fan for Got, well, I got licensed in 95, and one of the first radios I ever got was an ICOM radio. And uh, I particularly love ICOM HF radios, and this new 7100 looks like this is going to be a great radio. But I, ICOM just makes the, the neatest radios, and I've been a, a satisfied ICOM customer for many, many years. And I, I think that uh, you certainly owe it to yourself to check out this new this new 51A, especially if you're even thinking about getting into D-Star. It has really, really streamlined the process, and this is going to be a great little radio. Again, true dual band, true 5 watts. And all the stuff that you need is included right there in the box, the programming uh, uh, software and everything. Make sure you go by icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Right there you can find out more information on the new ID51 D-Star dual band handheld with the built-in GPS. You can also enter ICOM's weekly drawing for the ICOM swag. There are t-shirts and hats and everybody who registers automatically is entered into the monthly grand prize drawing. You can win a free ICOM radio. Again, it's icomamerica.com slash Ham Nation. There's the website right there. The official rules are all there. Check out all of ICOM's previous winners. Uh, see if your name is on there. Sign up and uh, good luck from ICOM and Ham Nation. And we thank them for being a, a sponsor here of Ham Nation. We love ICOM here at, at, uh, at Ham Nation. George, back to you. Uh, yeah, Don, thanks for that. And we've got a, a viewer video this time Julian got together for us. Uh, this one comes from George Huffman, KD4MXA. And he talks a little bit about fox hunting here. I, I thought it was real fine. So let's take a look at that. Hello. Let's go fox hunting. Bruin County Radio Amateur Society holds a monthly fox hunt. We meet at a local mall parking lot on a Saturday morning and wait for the fox to turn on. We have a pretty good turnout and a wide range of antennas and sniffers and techniques. Some use tape measure antennas, some use body fading or body blocking. Either way, the main objective of our fox hunt is to have fun. Once everyone has a pretty good bead or bearing on the fox, we all mount up in our vehicles and drive. Everybody has their own technique, but you have to be able to hear the fox. That's the fox transmitting in the background. My technique is to drive a little bit, get out, try to get another bearing, but not to drive past the fox. Our rules are a combination of mileage and time. Once the fox is found, a time clock starts and there's a small penalty for every minute that the fox is found after that. So the winner are usually a combination of time and mileage. So my main goal is not to drive by it. So I usually stop at major intersections, take a reading, and see if I need to turn there, which in this case I do. Uh, the strongest reading is straight ahead of me, so I'll drive just a little bit further, get out, and take another bearing. Usually the closer I get, the harder it is for me to tell where the fox is at. I don't use an attenuator. So I tune off frequency a little bit until I get close, and then I switch to the third harmonic, which is three times the VHF frequency. So once the fox is back on and transmitting, we'll take another bearing and drive a little further. Take another bearing and drive a little further. The main goal is to get there first. So once I have a bead on it, hop in the truck, take off again, and hopefully you're the first one there. Or in this case, the second one there. Another radio operator's beat me here. 
we're entering a local park that um, has baseball fields and soccer fields and a lake and a couple of nature trails so it could be hidden anywhere in here from this point ours is a combination tea hunt and fox hunt so we drive a little bit and usually the last part of it is walking a little bit I've already gotten a bearing on the fox and I'm looking to see if he concurs and he's pointing the same general direction that I was pointing in so we're probably both pretty close to it so back in the vehicles and off we go a little further we take a gravel road and it dead ends at this lake so from here on out it's going to be on foot so we just take a reading every once in a while while the fox is transmitting and try to find it so now it becomes a foot race our goal is to find it now before any other hams show up Now other hams are starting to show up. It's a race to see who can find it first. Once it's found, the timed portion of the fox hunt begins. And more hunters are showing up. At this point, the fox has been found and we're just waiting on everybody to find the fox. Half of the members are here and the other half are still trying to get here. The fox is actually hid underneath this bridge in a ammo can with a camouflage coat over it. You can hardly see it there in the rocks. Everybody gets really, really close, but it's hard to see without getting off the bridge. Most people want to stay on the bridge and look for it. Now everybody's waiting for the fox to begin transmitting again. And some, some members are really, really close to it and not even know it. But I can't think of a better way to spend a Saturday morning. Yeah. Hey, Tim. Like I said, our main goal is to have fun. <laughs> and as you can tell, you don't have to have the fanciest equipment to be the first ones there. So our, like I said, our main goal is to have fun and we achieve it every Saturday morning that we do this. And these two are the last to find the fox. So they're getting the fox now and they're gonna bring it back up there so we don't have to walk back down the hill. Gary, you did good. You only had an hour and eight minutes penalty, time penalty. <laughs> well, that's it. Hope you enjoyed the video. It's KD4MXA, 7-3. That is great stuff. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, Don. You know, uh, Tommy built a little Arduino controller for a handy talkie uh, so that we can do a fox hunt here coming up in the future. And he built one of those tape measure beams here in the last amateur logic. And we're looking forward to doing it. We're going to have to invite a few more people up because we figure it wouldn't be much fun if we hit it and look for it ourselves. You know, I've never done a fox hunt. I, I may have to come up there uh, by you and, and do that. I've, I've I've wanted to do that for a long time and I've never done it. I know that they do it every year uh, for the youth at Dayton, and I believe at uh, at Huntsville. I think I've seen them do it as well for the kids. And uh, but I've never done a fox hunt. I've I've got to do that. That's that's great fun. I, I, that looks like a lot of fun. It really does. Yeah, I have never done one myself either. Uh, actually, I I did try something like that for some interference we were having on the broadcast bands. Uh, number of years ago and i got kind of in the neighborhood didn't uh, actually get it located but fortunately the fcc came up and uh, they found where it was i had a similar experience back uh, back uh, in 96 or so uh, new orleans had the worst case of malicious interference in the country at the time and and i was on the team that that went and actually fox hunted this guy. So, so I guess I actually have it on a fox hunt. But uh, we got there just slightly after the, uh, the police and the feds did. So uh, that, was, that, was, uh, that was an entertaining evening. But uh, 
I, I think doing one of those for fun would be a lot more fun than than trying to find uh, someone who's who's trying to mess up our bands, George. But yeah, so definitely let me know when you do the fox hunt because I'll definitely come up for that. Okay, yeah, it's good skills to have. I mean, it, you know, it it has practical purposes. You go out and practice, rehearse, learn how to use your gear. And it could come in handy, you know, maybe you're trying to find someone who's lost or something. Uh, lots of uh, good possibilities that, you know, you could use that one day. Well, Don, what's in the news this week? Newsline has got some uh, some fairly interesting stories. There's some sunspot stuff and, and some other stuff. And uh, let's just uh, go ahead and roll that video, Alex, and we'll get into Newsline for this week. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 1,849, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, January 23rd, 2013. The Kodak 2 Digital Voice Project has developed a new program called FreeDV. This is a system to encode digital voice on any two-way radio using only 1.125 kilohertz of bandwidth. But says Kodak 2 researcher Bruce Perrins, K6BP, FCC regulations are not up to speed with the challenges of software-defined radio and open-source architecture. One of the changes that we make is bandwidth-based regulation rather than what FCC does today, which is they grant small permission to use a different modulation letter. And if you change the letter, you have to go back to FCC for permission. According to Perrins, there will be a filing of a 24-page request to the FCC that will propose the regulatory agency make several changes to the Part 97 rules. Amongst this will be to allow all digital modulation schemes and all published digital codes on the same ham radio bands. It will also push for a change to bandwidth-based regulation of the amateur radio service rather than the mode-segmented way that the hobby is governed today. Now contrast this to Canada. Canada just says, here's six kilohertz. Do what you want, those six kilohertz. Makes a lot more sense today. You might remember that it was just a few years ago when the ARRL proposed a similar bandwidth-based regulatory change that was widely criticized by many members of its membership, as well as the overall United States ham radio community. Now, back then, the overall ham radio community shouted the idea down. But this is 2013, and technology has reached a point where some changes may be desired to accommodate digital telephony on the high-frequency radio bands as well as on VHF and UHF. It'll be interesting to see where this one takes ham radio in the months and years ahead. Jim Davis, WD2JKD, reporting. A huge sun eruption on Sunday, January 13th, unleashed a wave of solar plasma aimed at the Earth that may amplify the northern lights displays and possibly cause difficulties in high-frequency radio communications. Amateur Radio Newsline's Stephen Kinford, N8WB. The solar eruption, called a coronal mass ejection, or CME, was expected to take about three days to reach Earth, bringing it in sometime between midday Wednesday the 16th and when this newscast goes to air. The good news is that scientists say that this particular event is not strong enough to interfere with satellites on orbit or electrical systems on Earth. Two particularly active sunspot regions called the AR-11652 and AR-11654 have produced four low-level M-class flares since January 11th. NASA says that the sun is in an active phase of solar cycle 24 and is expected to reach its peak sometime this year. Should you find the high frequency bands kind of dead for a few days, you might want to switch to 6 or 2 meters and beam north. When these solar storms hit, you never know what signals you might hear through auroral propagation. Russia appears to be getting back into the space race. According to published news reports, that nation will resume its long dormant program to explore the moon by sending an unmanned probe there in 2015. The spacecraft will be called Lunaglob, which translates to Moon Globe in English. According to the Interfax News Agency, Roscosmos Director Vladimir Popovkin says that the exploration payload will be carried by the first rocket to blast off from a new facility that Russia is building in its far eastern Amur region. Popovkin is the head of Russia's space agency. He and other Russian space officials have said Lunaglob would consist of an orbital module and a probe that would land on the moon. Once there, it will radio back information about samples it takes from the lunar surface. The last successful Russian launch of an unmanned probe to the moon was in the 1970s. Unfortunately, that nation has suffered setbacks in its space program in recent years, including unsuccessful satellite launches and the failure of a Mars probe in 2011. On the public service front, the Canadian Ski Marathon is spooling up with ham radio an important part of this event. The race is slated for February 9th and 10th, and it depends on ham radio volunteers to provide timely safety and logistical communications for the benefit of the skiers. The event runs between La Chute and Buckingham in western Quebec regardless of weather conditions. 
This year is the 47th anniversary for the marathon and the 40th year for amateur radio supporting the event. If you'd like to volunteer this year, please email Harold Hamilton, VA3UNK, to radio1 at admin2.ca or va3unk at gmail.com. You'll find more information online at the Canadian Ski Marathon Amateur Radio webpage. That is www.radio-1.ca. And finally this week, it's not too early to start planning for Hamvention. Early bird registration is now open for the 2013 Dayton Contest University to be held all day Thursday, May 16th at the Crown Plaza Hotel in Dayton, Ohio. 2013 is the seventh year in a row for Contest University in Dayton. Early signups will have the opportunity to help select this year's class outline topics. A list of suggested topics as well as registration information is on the web at contestuniversity.com. And the North Coast Contesters have announced that the 21st Annual Dayton Contest Dinner will be held Saturday night, May 18th, also at the Crown Plaza Hotel. Master of Ceremonies is CQ Contest Hall of Fame member and Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation Chairman John Doerr, K1AR. Dr. Robert G. Cox, K3EST, will be the featured speaker. The CQ Contest Hall of Fame inductions for 2013 will take place at this dinner. Tickets are only available for pre-purchase online at contestdinner.com. And that's all from Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news brought to you each and every week for 35 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. That was good stuff, Don. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to uh, get up a six-meter antenna and maybe try to take advantage of some of that uh, solar phenomenon there. You know, you can't work HF, but uh, VHF uh, could be wide open, and you'd never know it if you weren't listening. When six meters opens, I mean, it is just, it's magic, literally. That's why they call it the magic band, because you never know who you're going to hear and for how long. It just, it's... Uh, six meters is an amazing band, and uh, and yeah, when the when the sunspots hit it, you can, you can make some serious DX uh, contacts on a on a five watt six meter HT actually on FM. So, yeah, six meters is the coolest. Wow. Well, let's uh, go to smoke and solder tonight. You know, I've been building on that soft rock now for a number of weeks, and I finally got it finished. So let's take a look here at the finished product and. Uh, some little bit of troubleshooting I had to do. Tonight on Smoke and Solder, it's the grand finale of our Soft Rock RXTX Ensemble Build at Home project. So you've been watching me for several episodes now, constructing this Soft Rock RXTX Ensemble. It's been a lot of fun, and we finally got to the point of testing it. Well, I've got this old watt meter here, and uh, we won't talk much about that. It's for another band, uh, 11 meters. Anyway, I don't expect that it'll read much, uh, being that I'm operating on 40 meters here for my test. If we see any indication at all, we'll know something's happening. It read absolutely nothing when I keyed up the soft rock. I know you're supposed to have 10 volts peak-to-peak -peak when measured with an oscilloscope at the output of the unit, so I connected an oscilloscope. I only read 2 volts, and the waveform was somewhat distorted, uh. so I knew something was wrong. I looked over the resistor values to make sure that I didn't have the wrong values stuffed in there somewhere. They all looked okay. And the documentation said if your output was about half of what it should be, mine was a lot less than half, you should check T3 and T4. I did the resistance checks in the documentation, and they all measured zero, which was correct. But obviously something wasn't right. I decided to look at the schematic and began with T3, and I noticed that there are two secondary windings here, and they have to be in phase. Is it possible that I got those reversed? It's not only possible, it's likely. And that's exactly what the problem was. So I pulled out T3 and reinstalled it correctly, took my oscilloscope measurement again, and now I've got a full 10 volts. Actually, it was a little more than that, and I had to turn it down. And you can see it's a good clean sine wave as well. Now let's apply a little bit of modulation. Here's some AM modulation for you. We see that it's not quite making 100% there, so... A little less than 100%. That's okay. We can adjust that. Right now, we're mainly just trying to see if it works. 
and it looks like it does. Now that I have a working soft rock receiver, it's time to put all this in a case. And rather than build one myself, I've got the perfect solution here. KM5H Tom has created a couple of cases for soft rock projects. You can find them at km5h.softrockradio.org. The RXTX enclosure is only $22, and it's a nice custom-built case just for our soft rock. So let's put it together. Just stick the rubber feet on the bottom here because we don't want to scratch up our cabinets with this. And it looks good too. Everything's nicely labeled, so it should be easy to connect. It's taken us several weeks, but it's been a lot of fun. And now we've got a transceiver we built ourselves that we can be proud of. There's a couple of things I do want to point out, and that is the line in and line out jacks, in my opinion, are reversed. What they actually mean here is line out goes to line out of your sound card and line in goes to line in of the sound card. Also, you'll need two sound cards to make this work because you'll notice you've got a line in and a line out pair going to the soft rock. You also need a line in to get your microphone audio in and a line out to go to a speaker. And one final thing, low pass filters. With these soft rock ensemble kits, the lowest band in the group that you build may need a low pass filter in order to attenuate the second harmonic to acceptable levels. Fortunately, the kit comes with the parts necessary to build a low pass filter. You just pick out the band you want to build for and use those components. I hope you've enjoyed this build of the soft rock RXTX ensemble. It's been a lot of fun. And next week, we'll be back with something completely different. And I don't know what that something completely different will be yet, but uh, we'll find out. Here's the soft rock, though, and this really was a lot of fun, and it looks nice in that case as well. So I'm looking forward to getting it on the air. I, I feel confident it's going to work now. Uh, my one watt's probably not going to go very far with AM or sideband, so um, I'll probably need to do a CW or one of the digital modes and try to make a few contacts with it. Now, in our weekly contest, last week I asked the question, which of the following would reduce RF interference caused by common mode currents on an audio cable? A, placing a ferrite bead around the cable. B, adding series capacitors to the conductors. C, adding shunt inductors to the conductors. Or D, adding an additional insulating jacket to the cable. And I'm proud to say that almost everyone got this right, but there could only be one winner. And that is Bill Stearns, and he said the answer is A, placing a ferrite bead around the cable. So congratulations, Bill. You win this copy of Constructing HF Wire Antennas, a great book from Jerry Buston. And if you'd like to order one of these for yourself, call your favorite ham dealer. Now, for next week, we're going to give away a really nice prize here that comes courtesy of Frank at CheapHam.com. And this is a QJE 30 amp switching power supply. Now it looks kind of big in wow. the camera. It's it's not really quite that big. It's larger than the last one we had, but it's lightweight. You can hold it up with one hand. It's got uh, voltage and current meters on it, and a uh, cigarette lighter jack here in case uh, you need to charge your cell phone or whatever. Uh, the two big terminals here to hook your HF rig, and then some smaller terminals over here for hooking maybe some lower power accessories like your watt meter or whatever. So nice prize there, and uh, thanks, Frank, for donating that. 
If you'd like to win that, well, it's very simple to enter the contest. Just send me an email to hamnationcontest at gmail.com and tell me, where in the world is Gordo this week? And that should be an easy answer because I think it's been discussed here in the chat room, maybe at the beginning of the show. But we're going to do a drawing there and uh, see who wins this nice power supply from Cheap Pound. And the other contest, um, you can tune in and enter to win. Register after each Ham Nation episode for your chance to win weekly swag and automatically be entered in a monthly rig drawing, a grand prize from ICOM. Uh, You can maximize your chances of winning the grand prize by entering after every episode of Ham Nation. That means this month you can enter five times, and you'll be entered for the uh, weekly swag drawings as well as uh, January's grand prize drawing. And the grand prize this month is going to be the V8, or excuse me, the V80 Sport Radio, and it meets the same military specs and IP tests as the regular V80 Radio. Uh, So make the V80 Sport part of your amateur radio communications for emergencies and everyday use. You can enter by going to icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Don? That is a seriously nice power supply. I love the looks of it. The the, the lit uh, digital meters on the front. I mean, that is just, that's, put put that thing a little closer. Let's get another look at the front of that thing. That is, look at that. It's gorgeous. You Anybody know, would look at that. You got binding plugs. You got banana plugs. You've got the little uh, the little push jobs plus the uh, the cigarette lighter right there on the front uh, and the voltage and, and and current. That is nice. Yeah, and it's lightweight too. You know, these switching supplies are are really light and uh, usually small. Yeah, but but this is nice. You know, I can hear the fan running. You yeah. may can hear it, but you've got to get right up on it to hear it. Yeah. So it's quiet. It's cool. And energy efficient. So uh, I was not familiar with this QJE brand, but this is the second one that we've got from Frank. And looks like a nice rig. So uh, someone's going to get a nice supply. That's really nice. I'm, I'll be interested to find uh, maybe find one of those for sale up at uh, up at Jackson, see what those go for. Because that is a, if you're looking for a power supply, that I, you'd be hard pressed to find anything that that looked nicer than that one. That's for sure. I'm sure it works just fine too. But uh, I was just impressed at the looks of it. Just you know, the the nice uh, backlit meters uh, were just really really sharp. That's a good looking unit. Yeah, it really is. And I believe Leo has got a. A sponsorship announcement here for us from our new sponsor, Ting. Ting. Hello, Ambos. I'm going to call you that from now on. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I am Leo Laporte, W6TWT. You know what's cool, by the way, Bob and George and Gordo and Amanda and the Ham Nation team? I run into hams all the time. I was at the movies the other day. Guy comes up, says his call letters, and says, watch the show, love it. It's so cool. I meet hams. I meet so many hams all the time who watch this show and as a result discovered the rest of the things we do on Twit. That's wonderful. It's a great community, the ham community. And I bet you, I don't know, but I bet you, you hams would be interested in a better kind of cell phone service, wouldn't you? Ah, yes. Nobody likes their cell company. But it is possible to get great cell phone service at a great price from people who really want to do it right. I'm talking about Ting. Have you ever heard of it? No, of course you haven't heard of them. Uh, Ting, uh, in fact, you find out more at Ting.com. Ting is an MVNO. That is a mobile virtual network operator. They resell the Sprint network. And it was started by some guys who I really like, Elliot Noss and his crew at Two Cows, who uh, kind of specialize in taking businesses that are just, that nobody's happy with them. Maybe the cable companies would be next for this. I don't know. Nobody's happy with them. And just saying, we could do it better. So if you go, if you visit uh, hamnation.ting.com, you can take a look at what they're doing here. It is, there's no early termination fee. I never understood early. T- How can a company charge you money to stop doing business with them? It's like going to the dry cleaner. I don't want to go to you anymore. Oh, it's going to cost you 100 bucks because I gave you a bag. No, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. No early termination fee. No contract. You're month to month. But you get that same great Sprint service. If Sprint's good in your area, you're, go- you're golden. You could choose from all the best phones, including my favorite, the Galaxy Note 2, the Galaxy S3, uh, a huge variety of uh, phone choices. And 
and you only pay for what you use. So you, when you go to uh, ting.com, you can go to the plans section and you can choose, you know, your plan. It starts with the phones. And by the way, uh, as many phones as you want on a single plan, shared plan, shared minutes, shared uh, text, shared data. So it's great for a family or a small business. And it starts with $6 per phone per month. That's it. So let's, let's do a sample, okay? So let's say I'm a family. Uh, I'm going to go to plans uh, uh, here and do, uh, do the monthly plan. Let's say I'm a family um, uh, with uh, four kids, or three, two kids, two grownups. That's actually my family. Uh, and we're going to share, I think, a 1,000 minutes would be plenty, right? Uh, how many text messages? The kids sent a lot, but maybe a 1,000. And we'll get uh, we'll get all the data you you know you can get more but we'll we'll start at the max here the XXL so you choose like this now that system with three gigabytes of data thousand minute uh, minutes of phone a thousand text messages and four phones one hundred seven dollars a month total total for all four of us that's that's a hell of a deal and by the way I got to point out that includes hotspot and tethering caller ID three way calling video and picture messaging voicemail. The works. There's no upselling. And by the way, here's another thing. If you don't use all that, let's say you only use 1,000 a, a uh, megabytes of data. You'll see you only do it 100. To, they rebate you the difference. If you use more, no problem, no penalty. They just charge you the next uh, thing up. So you never pay these big penalties. You never waste money. You only pay for what you use with no overage charges. Credits on unused service, no add-on charges, no mysterious line items, recovery fees, all that other BS. Unlimited devices on a single plan. It's great. For the account control panel is fantastic. You can really see what you're doing and how, it, you know, how it's going to cost you. I just think Ting is fantastic. Let's take a look at the devices. Now, I, have to, I warn you right up front, they're not subsidizing the phone because there's no early termination fee and there's no, there's no contract. So you're going to pay... An unsubsidized price. Now, if you go to hamnation.ting.com, they will take $25 off that first device. So it, it, it is a pretty good deal here. And they do have, and I'm really happy to say, all the best devices. They even have a, kind of a beta program, bring your own Sprint device. And there are some limited phones to choose from, but they, it's all on the site. Look, at there's the LG Viper, $296, dual core, LTE ready phone. The Galaxy Nexus. Did you? Are, were you one of the people who wanted to get a Nexus 4? They don't have that. Nobody does. But they have the Optimus G, which is the big brother that's even better. They have the Galaxy S3 and the Galaxy Note 2. So they have a great selection of phones. You can save money. You can get a, you know, for the kids, get this simple and expensive phone. Uh, you get the phone. You activate. You're on the network. I am guaranteeing you, you're going to love it. And, uh, and the support is good, too. Help.ting.com. Very active customer forums, a simple ticketing system, video startup guides, video tutorials, and more. It is such a great service. We love Ting. No, you will too. Hamnation.ting.com for more information. And we thank Ting so much for their support. Ting and ICOM, we love you guys for supporting Ham Nation. Now back to G Gordo and George and Bob and Amanda and the gang. More ham action. More exciting ham action. Take it away. And Cheryl and Don, too. Don, Ham action. Say, yeah. <laughs> what do you say we bring Cheryl on in here and let's really get this program started? Let's do that. In fact, speaking of the chat room and Cheryl, I, I saw somebody wanted to make a, a mention of the Raspberry Pi net tonight. Uh, starts yeah. at, uh, yeah, 7 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, which is 1900 Pacific Standard Time, 0300 UTC. That's on the D-Star uh, Reflector 26 Alpha. 26 Alpha on D Star tonight. I wanted to make mention that I saw it uh, tonight. So that's a new a new net after uh, Ham Nation, the Raspberry Pi uh, net tonight on D Star 26 uh, Alpha. So Cheryl, what's going on in the chat room tonight? Good to see you. Hey there, Don. Yeah, I was I was going to take take a peek at that too. It looks like that does look a, like a brand new net tonight. I want to just reiterate it one more time because it is so new. Sometimes uh, people like to hear things a second time. So that Raspberry Pi Net Wednesday at 1900 hours Pacific Standard Time at 0, 0300 hours on Reflector 26A 
uh, as an America on D Star. So don't forget to catch it. And on 40 meters after the show, they have generally they're on 7.268 megahertz, if I'm not mistaken. And George usually has a lot of information on that. But I just wanted to say that we miss you, Bob. We miss you, Gordo. I'm getting a lot of questions as to what, where you are, Gordo. And I think you're in the Crystal Palace someplace, is what I think. Where is <laughs> a Crystal Palace. <laughs> So you must be there. Something to do with the, I, I don't want to give away the real answer, but, uh, you know, there, that was like a sneak peek question, you know, answer for you. But, you know, the other thing I wanted to, to quick say is, you know, Bob, uh, you know, he's, um, I want to just mention that he's, he has the NAM, uh, NAMM, the NAM show to 2013 in Anaheim, California. Uh, from the 24th to the 27th, so apparently that's uh, where he is and why why we are, are mi missing him. We're gonna. Why don't you just drop by the booth and and see Bob if you're out there and get a chance? He has some great information to share. Bob will be uh, joining up with uh, the Wrecking Crew at the show there. And NAM, for those who want to know, is the National Association of Music uh, Merchants. So check that out for them. And and, and I will move on to some of the questions here. We have, uh, I, there's a couple of other things that people wanted me to mention. We have KB1 UGS Mike. He says, can you please mention the SWL Fest? So I guess that's the NSAWA Winter SWL Fest. It's a gathering for all sorts of radio hobbyists. Some of the major shortwave broadcasters show up. That sounds interesting. And it's a great place to learn about radio as a hobby as well as amateur radio. It helped him get into the hobby. So that is basically, uh, I believe it was swlfest.com is the actual website if you want to check that out. And the other thing is I was to ask the inmates, uh, N1FOY, he's always out there in the <laughs> chat room. He's a regular. So, hey, inmates, that's you two guys, okay? It's Question, um, we'll, start with, <laughs> we'll start with George on this one, and it's going to come up for you too, Don. What was your first ham transmitter is the question. Go ahead. Uh, my first ham transmitter was a Kenwood... Well, I don't even remember the number of it now. I think it was a 241. It was a 50-watt, two-meter mobile. And everybody was telling me at that ham fest, no, get a dual-band rig. You're, you're going to want to do cross-banding and want to get on UHF and stuff. And uh, Jim and I, neither one listened to him. We both went out and bought those 241s. And I kept it about six months before I sold it and got a dual-band rig. Wow. Very good, very good. You got a, a nice little uh, experience with the first rig. That's always the most fun, I think. And how about you, how about you, Don? Inmate number two. What's your what's your answer to the first rig you ever had? Mine was well, I was studying for my test in 1994, and uh, for my birthday I went to Radio Shack and I bought myself an HTX 202 two meter handheld, and that was my first amateur band. Ham radio. I was uh, it was in the CB radio, you know, 20 years prior to that. But that was the first ham radio that I had. And then uh, at a ham fest, I bought what I would consider my first real, I yeah. guess you would call it, ham radio from from one of the big three. That was a Yaesu FT530 uh, dual band handheld. I still have that one laying around here somewhere. It even still works most of the mm -hmm. time. And if I can find a battery, but yeah, the old venerable HTX202. And I gave that to uh, my friend Mike Askins in uh, in uh, in Oklahoma, who uh, we've been friends since kindergarten or first grade. When he was uh, studying for his ticket, I said, "Well, here you'll need a radio, so I'll give you my first radio." And I've given him oh. several. I've given him a D Star radio too. So uh, wow. he's now licensed. He's he's uh, working on his. Uh, Working on his general now. And uh, so, yeah, the HTX 202 was my first ham radio. Awesome. Excellent. And I'll also take a stab at that question as inmate number three. That would be me. Okay. GP 300. It's a Motorola handy talkie. It was a gift from one of the groups that I used to, you know, hang out with. And that would be the Motorola. They say it as a joke, only as a joke, I'm saying the garbage pile 300. That's the, the actual handy talkie that they used to. I don't know if they still do it place in the NASCAR cars because if the cars would hit the wall, they would still operate because he can't really ruin a Motorola radio. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it does take yeah. some special software to program the thing. Not just anybody can do it. So there you it's have a brick that. that transmits. Yeah, <laughs> then, it's a, it's the, a brick the next, that transmits. Yeah, it's the, the brick, brick that, that transmits. Brick, Absolutely. That's right. 
has an antenna too. Absolutely. You can even have a remote mic on the thing. So the second radio that I had for the mobile was the um, uh, the ICOM, um, I think it was the V8000. It had 75 watts in the thing. And I had a, a super gainer antenna that I got. And it was just really the best thing um, at the time, I thought. And, and uh, last, the HF first rig that I ever had was the I It was really on loan from my brother. I didn't really buy the thing, but it was the um, the 706 Mark, Mark III. Very very nice uh, radio, you know, full full spectrum, lots of bands and things. But those mm -hmm. are my first three, I guess. I didn't ask you that, so I'm going on and on. I'm, I sound like I had a lot of coffee, but I'm, I'm really just uh, want to babble just a little bit here. And, uh, you know, we're ham radio operators, you know. What can Absolutely. I say? <laughs> um, let's see. There's, there's some other things here. Um, I keep getting this question a lot of times. Uh, it's not the first time out of the barn here, and I don't know if they're satisfied or unsatisfied. We always want to try to get you the best answers we can, but KD8, um, OCL Rand Randall, he wants to ask, um, can someone address operating outside of your country of issue, what rules apply, and where to find information? Most of the, you know, it's it's... It's in the FCC rules, and it's on the extra exam is what uh, NB2G Bob had answered. And then we had another person, VE3MIC Mike. He says for operating in Canada, there was a website that he gave, and it was the uh, HTTP with the S, and then you have the colon forward slash forward slash, but it's www.rac.ca forward slash EN forward slash amateur hyphen radio forward slash regulatory forward slash operating hyphen in hyphen Canada. So that was kind of nice Did of them to try that? and do that. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, you have I'm to play talking. that back on slow-mo. Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, I That's think a little bit long just, of a one. If, if you go and Google CEPT, that's what you need to know. CEPT, that's the regulations for everyone uh, interoperability with uh, going uh, to foreign countries and whether or not you can operate with your license. Go and Google uh, the CEPT, and you can also you probably search on the AWR website as well, but CEPT, Charlie Echo Papa Tango, CEPT, that's what you want to Google, and you'll find it all about it. Thanks for simplifying that, Don. Much, much uh, better, easier to remember on, on short notice if you don't have a pen and paper, actually. So we have Chris, N8OXC. Says, anybody going to Hamcation in a couple, week? are you, in a couple weeks? Are you guys going to go at all? Um, Don, are you? No, I've never, made, uh, I've never made Orlando. I made, uh, I made Miami uh, back in 95 or 96, and then you know Dayton started going in 99. But I've never made Orlando, and I want, I want to so bad, but not going to make it this year. All right, and and George, would you by be, by chance uh, be going? No, unfortunately, I'm not going to make it either. This is a tough time of year for me to get away, and I need to go to Orlando or Miami or or both. Really, I used to live in South Florida and never been to a ham fest down there. Wow. Well, you might want to check that out sometime. But another viewer uh, in the chat room uh, and participant, George uh, uh, KD four EB. Uh, he, he typed EBLM. I'm not sure there might be an extra character in there. He says, is George coming to Dayton this year? We need your answer. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, I'm coming to Dayton Yay! this year. <laughs> last year was my first and certainly won't be my last. So uh, Tommy and I both have plans to uh, come again this year. And boy, looking really to a, a good time and I'm going to carry uh, my Groucho glasses with the mustache and all or something so I can hide and get <laughs> through that flea market this time. And a hat, too. And a hat. And the hat. Yes, and the hat. <laughs> that sounds good. Well, I just wanted to say a little bit about the fox hunt. I do have one experience with the fox hunt. I just want to add to that um, feature earlier. And it was with the North Shore Radio Club, and we went to an area that had a bunch of restaurants and stores and things like that. So we met at the at the at, at one of the coffee shops. I will that will re, that will remain nameless. <laughs> and in any event, everybody kind of trickled in, and it was it was really a great time. And you know, there was some up, you know upper and lower level parking lots to go in, and berms, and you know everything. It was just it was so much fun. And I guess some of the guys were they they said they saw me searching in the parking lot. They had to duck down in this car because they thought that I'd find him. I thought it was going to be on a post in one of the parking lots. And mind you, I didn't have the, D, the, the the direction finding equipment. I was just like saying, where would these guys put it? Where would these guys put it? So it is really a lot of fun. 
And I, I highly recommend it. I, I just think it's the greatest thing that any kind of club that wants to do that. Um, they, and you can do a double fox hunt. I've, I've heard of like find one and then you have to find a second one and, you know, maybe make some prizes out of it or something like that. But um, then and, and then in conjunction to all this, then Rick uh, WB5 CCO, um, he he actually had a comment. He says, well, how about a pig? They're smarter than horses, foxes and rabbits. So why don't you have, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of a, he was just making a little bit of a line there. But other than that, I highly recommend a fox hunt. I think it's really great that you brought that up. I think everybody should experience it. Um, it's just one of the most fun things besides field day, which is my favorite. And that's pretty much what I have for tonight, guys. Um, if you have anything you want to ask me or whatever, we could do that too. But um, back over to, to you, Don. You know, talking about animals, I'll, I'll never forget. I had gone to the Huntsville, Alabama Ham Fest one time, and and uh, my buddy who doesn't have the uh, quite as quick or uh, I guess a, a warped sense of humor that I have, he still had his button on his shirt that said Huntsville Ham Fest on it. That you get a, a button from the Huntsville Ham Fest. That's your you know, instead of a sticker or a name tag, have a little button there. And so we went to uh, a restaurant. Um, uh, Cracker Barrel, actually, it was in Birmingham, and he's paying his bill. And the lady there, in this lovely Birmingham uh, accent, goes, "Huntsville Ham Fest." Well, I lived here all my life. I never heard of the Huntsville Ham Fest. What y'all do up there? Chase pigs up and down the street? <laughs> <laughs> I just, oh gosh! It's just one of those one of those memories that that uh, you know, for the uninitiated, you know, what's a ham? What's that? I've never heard of a Huntsville ham fest. I live here all my life. Anyway, that's, that's just that I get tickled every time I think about that. But, yeah, yeah. but uh, I'm, I'm going to miss Dayton this year. I'm, I'm, I'm on an every other year schedule now, and so uh, I'm going to miss this year. And, and I really, really, I miss, I miss Dayton when I don't get to go. But I am going to my 35th high school reunion uh, the, the week after Dayton in Oklahoma. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. We've uh, just about got to the end of our string. Cheryl, is there anything else uh, that anyone wants to know about the chat room before we wrap this thing up and put a bow on it for tonight? Well, I, I think the way I want to wrap it up is I don't really get too much chance to ever say hi to Leo Laporte. So uh, hi, Leo, W6TWT from K9BIK. And this is Cheryl. And, uh, you know, it's it's nice that you're, you're on there. We want to catch you on the air sometime and let us know what frequency you're on. And I want one of your QSL cards, too. So, hey, thanks, everybody, for watching and, and joining us here tonight. We love having you. And uh, thanks for being in the chat room with me. It's always great. And keep your questions coming. 73K9BIK. Thanks, Cheryl. I'm so glad we got to an extended chat room section tonight. The shows have been so jam-packed lately with so much stuff that it's like we we hate to ignore the chat room. We always try not to. And it was so nice to have 15 or 20 minutes tonight just to talk about the chat room. So we really, uh, really appreciate you being in here and, and doing that for us. And uh, and the, the soft rock finale was just the best, George. The smoke and solder, there's, there's a reason why that is the most popular segment on this show. And uh, just you just have done an outstanding job with that project, and I can't wait to see what uh, what comes out of your uh, what come what comes out of the lab next week, George. <laughs> I have no idea, Don. And by the way, if you see someone at Dayton wearing this hat, it's not me; it, it's someone else who looks like me. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Don, uh, a good show this week. I really enjoyed it, and thanks everyone for being here and. Join us again next week. We know that Gordo will be back, and I'm sure he's going to have some video with him. But uh, Bob will be out for one more week at the NAM show. And uh, who knows what we're going to do next week. We don't. That's right. The in, the inmates are still running the asylum. So uh, uh, anyway, thanks, everybody, for, for being here tonight, and thanks for your support of, of Ham Nation. Thanks to Ting, and thanks to ICOM for uh, sponsoring us. And, uh, and uh, George, do you have a list of, uh, of the nets tonight? Can you hold that up with the, uh, the D-Star net or the HF nets? Do we have that? There we go. Well, there I sure we go. do. The, um, let's see, 80 meters. I don't know if it's really as much of a net as it is a rack to you at 3.847 or 3.850. The 40-meter net, 7.268 megahertz. Uh, the 20-meter net, if the band is allowing, will be 14.268. Echo Link is the Star Dewdrop in Star Conference Server. That's node number 355-800. And D Star is Reflector 14 Module C, or if you don't have a D-Star radio, you can listen at wx4adx.com slash listen. 
Yeah, and we uh, really appreciate all the net controllers who who put in all the hours to uh, uh, to do the nets in support of Ham Nation. It's a, it's it's a great effort by everyone, and uh, I just I just feel so fortunate to just be a little bitty part of this show. And thanks to to Bob for uh, letting uh, a goofy Oklahoma guy transplanted to to Mississippi uh, sit in tonight for him. And and George, uh, thank you for uh, for for letting us play here tonight. And we just had a great time, and we'll see everyone next week. Here on uh, on Ham Nation, same ham time, same ham channel. So good night, everyone. 73 from AE5 to W. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, George. Same ham Thank nation. You, <laughs> good night, Al. <laughs>